Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, for those of you who've been watching the channel now for a while, you know we've started a new series on real life lessons in what not to do. And we started with Mr. Hero Delivery Driver Guy, and you guys really provided some fantastic comments, even so much that we ended up doing another video basically highlighting some of the comments. Well, I need to propose another scenario for you today. This is a real life scenario. It's about something that happened to somebody in my neighborhood. So today, let's talk about, did Adam go too far in trying to stop a catalytic converter theft? Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button down below. If you want to stay up to date on issues related to your second rights, click the subscribe button, click the little bell logo if you want to be notified when we post new videos. And most importantly, especially with this video, I want to hear your comments. I want to hear what your thoughts are. I want to see how much you guys have learned by watching this channel. And let me hear what you think should or should not happen here. Okay, so I'm going to set up the scenario, and unlike with Mr. Hero Delivery Driver Guy, I do not have a video on this one, and candidly, even if I did, when you hear the rest of the story, you would probably see why I would not post this video. Uh, this is a story of a guy who lives in my neighborhood. Actually, he's a friend of mine, and uh, we're going to call him Adam for purposes of, to, of today's uh, lecture. Uh, that is not his real name, and one of the reasons that we chose not to do an interview is I didn't really want to expose Adam to any potential criminal liability because I think that there may be some. Law enforcement is not aware of this issue, uh, and so let's try to keep it that way for him. Okay, so uh, last weekend I was over in God's country, over in Spokane, Washington, speaking to a fine group of Second Amendment supporters over there and was out of town when I spoke to my wife on Sunday morning before I flew back home. Uh, I was told by her that she believed she heard a couple of gunshots that night. Now, I live in a neighborhood in Kirkland. Not a, I'm not going to give you the specific neighborhood, but I live in a nice neighborhood in Kirkland. It's not a ritzy neighborhood right on Lake Washington, but it is a nice, clean, safe neighborhood, and we have very low crime there. So hearing gunshots in my neighborhood would be incredibly rare. Now, my wife is not particularly familiar with gunshots. So I kind of just chalked it up as probably some kid shooting off firecrackers or things like that. Now, later that morning when I talked to my 17-year-old son, he too told me that he thought he had heard a couple of gunshots that night. Now, my 17-year-old son goes to the range with me quite frequently, and he is abundantly aware of what gunshots sound like. Well, one of the first questions I asked both of them is, did you hear any sirens or anything like that afterwards, to which neither of them said no. And that led me to believe that in this particular part of Kirkland, had there been a report of shots fired, I, I really do believe that the Kirkland police would have come in full force. Um, they very effectively police this community. And so I, I do believe there would have been a significant police presence in response to a report of shots being fired. Well, Sunday evening, I got a call from a friend of mine who lives a few blocks over. We're gonna, like I say, we're gonna call him Adam. Now, Adam told, wanted to run something by me because he'd been involved in a self-defense situation involving the discharge of his firearm, and he needed to run the scenario by me. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the same scenario by you, and I really just wanna hear what your thoughts are. Okay, so it's approximately three o'clock in the morning. Uh, Adam lives in a, in a, again, a nice neighborhood. He's got a couple of teenage sons. So between him, his wife, his teenage sons, he's a bit of a car guy. There's usually multiple cars in the driveway and parked out front of his house. Uh, about three in the morning, he is awakened by his, one of his teenage sons who says, dad, there's some guys out by one of the cars outside and they're making a bunch of noise. Uh, Adam looks out the window, sees a pair of legs sticking out from underneath the car. Here's a sawzaw, sees a couple other guys on lookout, and we all know what's going on here. We have a catalytic converter theft. Now, for those of you who've been watching for a while, you know we've done a video on this, and I actually had to direct Adam to that video uh, after he gave me his scenario, um, but we'll post the link for that down below. Okay, so 
We know now, at this point, under RCW 9A.16.020, subsection 3, that Adam has the right to use any reasonable, necessary, and proportional force to defend his property. But since it is only a property crime at this point, we can all agree that under RCW 9A.16.050, Adam does not have the right to use lethal force at this point. Adam decides he's gonna grab he's gonna go outside. Now, obviously, he does what I think any other responsible person would do. He does arm himself because you don't know what you're gonna get into out there. And so I, I I would have done exactly the same thing. Now, Adam doesn't have a holster for the firearm. It's a Glock 19, he it's loaded. Uh, he decides to sneak out the back door, which from a strategical standpoint, may or may not been the right thing to do. And you can comment on that below, but he does manage to sneak out the back door around the side of the house and lo and behold, he surprises the would-be thieves at the car. Now, because Adam doesn't have a holster when he surprises the would-be thieves, yes, the firearm is at a low ready position in his right hand. According to Adam, he never points the firearm at any of the individuals, and the two that are not underneath the car immediately see Adam, immediately see the firearm, and they start scattering back towards their car. Adam chases after them for a moment, realizing he's not going to get them, and again, now he's chasing after them with a loaded firearm in his hand. Uh, by this time, when he turns around to go back to his car, the third individual now has crawled out from under the car, and he too is running towards the car, which is starting to move down the roadway. The first two thieves have now already gotten back into the getaway car, if you would, and the third thief is making his way there. Okay, so at this point, it's so far so good, right? He absolutely has the right to arm himself to go out there and protect himself. He actually has the right to display a firearm under 941-270 because it is an act of lawful self-defense. He is defending his property. And so displaying a firearm, letting these thieves know that you are armed, I do not believe is unlawful at this point. But at this point now, the thieves have all scattered back to the getaway car and they start taking off down the road, which because the car was parked in a southerly uh, location from where Adam was, and they were going to leave to the north, that meant that they were going to drive right by Adam's location. Adam, at this point, now decides it's time to stop these thieves. So what does he do? He fires one shot into what he believes is the front passenger side tire, and he fires a second shot into what he believes is the back passenger side tire. Now, the car continues down the roadway, and I specifically asked them, well, how do you know you haven't hit the tires? And the only answer I got was, I'm a good shot, and candidly, I don't buy that. Um, the would-be thieves take off, and whether the tires got blown out or not, we don't know because nobody ever found them or the car. Now, amazingly, despite all of this commotion in a quiet bedroom neighborhood in Kirkland, Washington, the only neighbors who come out are the ones right next to Adam, who very fortunately are strong Second Amendment supporters themselves and saw really no problem with what occurred. Everyone goes back to bed. End of story. No other neighbor was alerted to this. No other neighbor called law enforcement. Law enforcement was never, ever contacted. And to this day, Adam has had no contact with law enforcement, which is one of the several reasons why I decided not to interview him for this video. Now, what I want to hear from all of you is this. I think that we can all agree that Adam was absolutely lawfully justified in ar arming himself because, candidly, you don't need a justification to arm yourself, right? That's our God-given right. He is certainly entitled to go out there and use reasonable force to protect his property, which is a catalytic converter. And yes, that reasonable force could include displaying a firearm, especially when he's outnumbered three to one. But what I want to know from all of you is, is after this apparent threat is now over and the threat really only was to his property, does Adam have the right to discharge his weapon not once but twice to shoot out the tires of the would-be thieves and what other kind of trouble could he have possibly gotten into? Now, for those of you who've been watching the channel for a while, you know that under RCW 9.41.230, 
we cannot willfully aim or discharge a firearm at a person, otherwise we could be found guilty of a gross misdemeanor. The statute specifically reads, for conduct not amounting to a violation of Chapter 9A.36 of the RCW, any person who, B, willfully discharges any firearm, air gun, or other weapon, or throws any deadly missile in a public place, or in any place where any person might be endangered thereby, a public place shall not include any location at which firearms are authorized to be lawfully discharged. So under 941.230, subsection B, it is unlawful to willfully discharge a firearm in any location where anyone might be endangered. And the only exception to that statute is, of course, if you are in the act of lawful self-defense. But wait, there's more. And this would include just about any of you living with inside city limits anywhere in the state of Washington. We know that municipalities can have very few firearm restrictions. We know under the state preemption law that the state of Washington gets to really dictate the rules as it relates to firearms. There is a couple limited exceptions, however, as to where munis what municipalities can do as far as restricting firearms. The two most common exceptions are is they can zone land in a way where it makes it difficult for firearm stores to be within a close proximity to schools or parks or things like that. That is not unlawful. That is not unconstitutional. The other thing that municipalities can do is they can restrict areas within their city where firearms can be discharged. In fact, most cities inside of King County, Washington, have actually restricted the discharge of firearm anywhere inside that county, with the limited exception of if you are engaged in an act of lawful self-defense. Well, the city of Kirkland is no different because just a couple of years ago, they too adopted a, their own municipal co code, Kirkland Municipal Code 11.41.180, which reads as follows. Except for law enforcement officers in the performance of their official powers and duties and individuals in the lawful defense of self or others. It is unlawful to discharge any firearm in any portion of the city due to the reasonable likelihood that humans domestic animals or property will be jeopardized thereby and then the only exception would be is if you are an authorized gun range or something to that effect so it is possible that you might think that adam is guilty both of a violation of state law 941 230 of the rcw or 114180 of the kirkland municipal code and listen what i really want you all to take from this and the same goes for mr hero delivery driver guy is that a split second decision can have catastrophic personal, financial, and legal consequences. Because I can vouch for Adam. Adam is a good guy. Adam is a guy who I would hang out with. Adam is a guy who I have hung out with. Adam is a guy who has now been lectured by me and I don't think would ever do something like this again in the future. But the bottom line is this, is that number one, when you discharge firearms in a suburban community like that, even if you're just shooting at tires, we do not really know where those rounds are going. And while Adam may claim that he's a good shooter, I really honestly think that these types of shots are best left for Hollywood sets. The bottom line here is, is that the minute those three would-be thieves were back in the car, the threat was over. And anything that Adam would have done from that point would have been him trying to detain them through the use of unlawful force. And what a prosecutor would call that is vigilante justice. What else could happen is as well, candidly, he could have missed the tires. And honestly, he very well may have. Now, a bullet ricocheting off cement is going somewhere. I recognize that it's lost a tremendous amount of velocity at that point, but has it lost enough velocity that it's not gonna damage property or potentially injure another person? Or how about if just all of the neighbors come out because they hear gunshots, which in this neighborhood is rather uncommon. And all it takes is one 911 call shots fired and now you're going to have seven or eight of the finest kirkland police officers in the neighborhood and yeah they're going to be knocking on adam's door and they're going to be asking him what happened and adam's going to have to tell him what happened 
And when he tells him the last part of the story, I think that law enforcement would have had the same reaction that I would have. Oh, this story sounds so, so far so good, so far so good. And then suddenly it's like, and then you did what? The other thing that Adam and everyone else in a similar situation needs to recognize is that if a round were to be discharged willfully out of his firearm, and somehow or another either end up going into a house, ricocheting into a house and striking another person and causing injury or worse yet, death. Adam is likely on the hook for that as well. Well, the good news is, is that nothing came of this and nothing will likely come of this. But I do want to hear from you what you guys think Adam should or should not have done and what potential criminal liability he could face. Listen, you may have more questions about this issue or anything related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com. Or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, remember, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, not so much like Adam, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.